Well, I want to pose a very important question to you uh, this afternoon, the answer to which will uh, really be indicative of your spiritual uh, understanding, a measure of your spiritual growth and uh, development, and also a, a key determining factor uh, really in your spiritual usefulness uh, to God. And, and the question is very simply this, is there anything wrong with being rich? Is there anything wrong with being rich? Now, you might think uh, a couple of things to start with. Why are you asking us this question? Well, because all of you are rich. Notice I did say, all of you are rich. Now, I'm not talking about spiritual riches, because sadly, I'm not as confident that everyone under the sound of my voice this afternoon has spiritual riches as I am that everyone under the sound of my voice this afternoon has material riches. I'm talking about material riches. And I'm basing uh, this message on a great presupposition that all of you are rich. Now let me explain myself. In Scripture, we're told that having food and clothing, we are therewith to be content. And so our contentment has to do with whether or not we have food to eat and clothes to wear. Unless I'm completely in the dark about any one of your situations, all of you have ample food to eat and all of you have plenty of clothes to wear. And if you don't, I would refer you back to an earlier passage in the letter of James. All you need to do is make that known to us and we will not give you a pat on the back and say, be warmed and filled, but we will actually give you the things which are needful for the body. Because even that passage makes the primary point of emphasis on, are you warm? Do you have clothes to wear? And are you filled? Do you have food to eat? Well, you say, now, Barry, there you go again. Did you overstate your case when you said that all of us are rich because you're just talking about, you know, are, are, are we getting by? Are we, are we at a level with which we ought to be content with our circumstances? Being rich is certainly a bit more than that. Being rich is, you know, uh, having loads of money in the bank. Uh, being uh, rich is being able to take holidays to exotic locations. Uh, being, being rich is, you know, uh, having uh, money to, to purchase toys. And, you know, someone has well said, you know, the difference between boys and men, the price of their toys. And, uh, you know, if you have plenty of money to buy lots of expensive uh, toys, uh, you know, like cars and boats, or you got, you know, uh, money, women, for a lot of expensive trinkets, uh, you know, like... Uh, jewelry, well, and again, he mentioned that earlier in the letter uh, as well. Well, that's what it means to be rich. Not so quick. Because in reality, in Scripture, being rich still has to do with clothes to wear and food to eat. Probably the most famous passage in the New Testament, at least, comparing and contrasting the rich and the poor would be the story about the rich man, anonymous, and the poor man, known by his name, Lazarus. 
That's an interesting thing in and of itself, isn't it? On what basis was the rich man said to be rich? You remember? Ah, you probably memorized those verses in Sunday school, but most of us are long enough in the tooth that if we did memorize those in Sunday school, it was in the authorized version, and that's absolutely fine. Do you remember he was dressed in purple and fine linen and that wonderful expression, and he fared sumptuously every day. So on what basis was he said to be rich? He was dressed in purple and fine linen. He had nice clothes to wear, the sort of clothes you have on this afternoon. And on what basis was he said to be rich? He fared sumptuously every day. It was like a, you know, a, a Sunday lunch uh, every day. It was like a, a, a Christmas dinner, uh, you know, on, on a regular uh, basis. Uh, this, this man uh, was, was not said to be wealthy, you know, be, because he, you know, went on treks across the ancient world uh, or because his wife had expensive jewelry. Now, he was said to be wealthy because he had plenty of good food to eat and he had plenty of nice clothes to wear. Again... That's all of us, isn't it? Be honest. It is. You do realize that more than 95% of the people in this world would consider every person in this room this afternoon to be wealthy, whether we consider ourselves to be rich or not. You would acknowledge that, wouldn't you? When you got up this morning, did you have electricity? When you got up this morning... Did you have water? When you got up this morning, did you have a kettle, a cooker, a hob? When you got up this morning, did you have a closet, a wardrobe, some clothes? When you got up this morning, did you either have uh, a car in which uh, to come to church or fare for public uh, transport or a friend who would offer you a lift or strength and power and motivation to walk. What are we complaining about? All of us know something of what it means to be rich. So back to that question. Is there anything wrong with being rich? No, you didn't want to give too much away with your... Uh, you know, uh, nonverbal communication uh, when I was asking the question uh, a few minutes ago. You're, you're sort of, you know, holding your cards close to the vest uh, this, this afternoon, and that's okay, because uh, I, I know, and you'll soon know that I know, uh, what the reality is uh, with most of us. But before we answer, maybe I could say uh, there are other people who are very, very happy to answer the question. Some will say categorically, yes. There is something wrong with being rich. With people in this world who don't have a place to live, people in this world who don't have clothes to wear, people in this world who don't have food to eat, people in this world who don't have access to education or employment, people in this world who don't have access to health care and to education, on and on it goes. It, it's unthinkably, unspeakably bad to be rich. Yes, that's what many would say. And if you don't believe it, uh, just open your newspaper. Uh, or maybe open your phone. And just have a look. And you can soon discover that there are many people, many people who've come to the conclusion that yes, there is something wrong with being rich. Oh, but then most of us here this afternoon wouldn't necessarily buy into that. And we would say, well, no, there's... There's nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with having 
you know, a nice house or a nice car or two. Nothing wrong, you know, with having a good clothes to wear and, you know, good food to eat. And uh, nothing wrong with having a bit of money, you know, laid back in the bank. And, and certainly nothing wrong with, you know, being able to take a, a, a holiday or two or maybe even three in, in, in the course of a year. No, nothing wrong with that. I mean, we work and we're responsible and, you know, we're, we're diligent in our labor and, and then the Lord is good to give us the opportunity to uh, enjoy uh, some of that. So don't, don't start guilt tripping us and making us think there's something wrong, you know, with being, you know, blessed and privileged uh, uh, by God's mercy to have these things. And no, of course not. There's nothing wrong with uh, being uh, rich. Uh, you, you've heard both of those answers, haven't you? Or perhaps you've even entertained both of these options in your own thinking. Now, uh, here, maybe I could give you my answer to the question, is there anything wrong with being rich? And you say, well, Barry, with, with all due respect, we, we didn't... We, we didn't meet this afternoon to hear your answer. We met to hear God's answer. Well, what I want to do is share with you my answer, which I believe has come from uh, a, a study of, of this text and, and preparation to deliver uh, this, this message. And, and then you can discern God helping you with kind of a Berean spirit, not a barbarian spirit, but a, a, a Berean spirit. Don't tear me apart. But do tear the text apart and look into it and see if it actually says what I'm saying that it says. I have considered the question long and hard, is there anything wrong with being rich? And here is my studied answer. It depends. And so let me uh, share with you why I would answer the question, is there anything wrong with being rich, with that very unambiguous statement, it depends. Well, what does it depend on? Could I uh, submit to you, first of all, that it depends on how you got rich. It depends on how you got rich. Now, what does the text say? I don't want to spend all my time this afternoon telling you what it does not say. Uh, it would probably be a good idea to spend some time telling you what it does say. Um, what does it say here about how these people got rich? Come now, you rich Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the lost days. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person he does not resist you. Two, two things here about how these people got or acquired uh, their riches. Some of these people acquired their riches by fraudulent means. He says, behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud are crying out against you and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Some of these people had acquired their riches by fraudulent means. And so is there something wrong with them being rich? Absolutely. They had acquired their riches 
fraudulently. But not only do we see some had acquired their riches by fraudulent means, some in this text had even acquired their text by means of murder. You notice he will say, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person who in his weakness did not resist you. And again, this is a part of this continuing theme which actually began in chapter 4 when he would say what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you. Verse 1, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you, you desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet, and cannot obtain, so you find and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And so some have acquired their riches fraudulently. Some have acquired their riches criminally, even up to and including murder. And he says there is no way under any circumstances that you can say, oh, there's nothing wrong with being rich. It actually depends on how you acquire your riches. It actually depends on how you get rich. It actually does matter. So we live in days of uh, get-rich-quick schemes. Uh, We uh, live in the days of uh, a, a national lottery Uh, where even uh, professing Christians think little, if anything at all, about uh, purchasing a a lottery uh, ticket. And and let me just uh, share with you that I think this is by definition the sort of things that James is is talking about because a a lottery is, is a situation where your winnings... Should you be the one who wins, come at the expense of everyone else's uh, losses. And the, the reality uh, is uh, you, you may have acquired it legally, uh, but you have not acquired these riches honorably. It does matter how you get your uh, riches. But not only uh, would I answer the question, it depends Uh, on how you get your riches, uh, but I I would suggest to you also that it depends on how you use your riches. It could be that you have gotten your riches by means of work. Praise the Lord. It may be that you have gotten your riches by means of inheritance. Praise the Lord. It may be that you have have gotten uh, your riches just through uh, the kind benefaction of others. Praise the Lord. There is certainly nothing wrong with working and experiencing uh, the benefit of hard work and a faithful stewardship. There's absolutely nothing wrong with uh, receiving money uh, by inheritance. A good man, the proverb tells us, uh, leaves an inheritance to his children's children. The transfer of wealth uh, generationally is a a tremendous blessing uh, indeed. And and some of you and some of us have just been the recipients of the kind benefaction of others uh, where money has been... Uh, given gifts have been given, property has been given, such that you would say, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm rich. Well, now, are you in the clear? Well, it's not only a matter of how you get your riches, it's also a matter of how you use your riches. He says, it's possible for you to acquire your riches in a completely honorable way and manner, but for something to become desperately wrong with your riches by the way you make use of them. Let me again point you uh, to the text, and I'll, I'll show you 
uh, we, we tend to be at one or the other uh, extreme. What does he say? Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the lost days. And then the part we read a moment ago, Behold the wages of the laborers. Uh, who mowed your fields, which you have kept back by fraud, crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have uh, reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. And now, here we are, uh, verse 5. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence and have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Do you see again two different ways in which money is used or riches are used, both of which, both of which make, quote, being rich something that is problematic. So uh, you, you know who you are. And if you don't, your wife or husband knows uh, who you are. Uh, most people tend to be either savers or spenders. I'm not asking for a show of hands and... You know, feel free to not make eye contact at this point, you know, so uh, to avoid any uncomfortable embarrassment. Uh, but, uh, oh, I, I just wish you could see what I can see with C.J. and Glau right now. I can, I can suss them out immediately, which one is uh, which, just by the wonderful look on their faces. So what's happening here? Some people introduce a problematic element to their riches and to their wealth by saving too much. Now, wait a minute. Can you ever save too much? You never know what needs you might have in the future. You were telling us just last week, you know, that, that we don't know what the future is. Uh, holds. And certainly it would be sensible, since we don't know what the future holds, to, you know, put back as much money as possible for that very otherwise uncertain future. Now that makes really good sense, practically speaking. But spiritually speaking, because this is not the wisdom from below, the wisdom of this world, this is the wisdom from above, the wisdom that comes through God's Word and by the application of that Word by His Spirit uh, to regenerate hearts. He says, you have laid up treasure in the last days. Brothers and sisters, could I, I set before you this afternoon that if James could say to the first recipients of his letter that they were laying up treasure in the lost days, how much more so would it be true of those of us living today? You see, we've got this situation. I don't know if you noticed the uh, hymns that we have sung uh, this afternoon and the one which is yet to follow all touch on the big picture of the Bible. You've got creation, you've got fall, you've got redemption, and you've got the consummation of all things. Now, what you need to recognize is that biblically speaking... The entire period of time between redemption and the consummation of all things is called the lost days. That's why Peter could say on the day of Pentecost that this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel when he said in the lost days. And then we see the inauguration of the lost days. And so when James is writing this, the people to whom he was writing were in the lost days. If they were in the lost days, we must be in the very lost hours, perhaps even the very lost minutes of the lost days. And it becomes nonsensical, doesn't it? For the Lord Jesus Christ to return, for you either in death or to take you to be with him at his glorious reappearing, 
and for you to leave loads of money that you have stored up, that you have treasured up in the lost days, when you had the opportunity to make use of your accumulated wealth to help speed the progress of the gospel generationally in your town and geographically from your town to the ends of the earth. My friends, if you have money that's at your disposal, you are not going to be commended at the end of the day by how much you have saved. You're going to be commended at the end of the day by how well you have invested that in the spread of the gospel through evangelism, church planting, and mission to the ends of the earth. So if you're always in accumulation mode and are never in distribution mode, you've actually erred in your understanding of riches. So some err by uh, saving too much. That may, may be about three of us. Now, here is the rest of us. We err by spending too much. Notice what he said in the text. He says, you have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You've fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Here the problem is not that the reader is, is saving too much, but that they're spending too much. And by the way, you don't have to be extremely wealthy to spend too much. Do you know we are told that the average person in Western Europe and in North America spends between 15 to 20% more than they earn. The average person in Western Europe and North America spends between 15 to 20% more than they earn. And what happens is if a pay rise comes or some unexpected income uh, arrives or we are enriched in some way by some means... Well, what does that mean? Well, to the average Western European or North American, it means, well, we can now have an enhanced standard of living. We can now maybe buy a few more things. We can, you know, stop deferring gratification on some of these things. And we, we can spend more and we can buy more. And guess what happens inevitably? Even after you have additional income, you still find yourself spending 15 to 20% more than you're making. And that's been proven to be true over the generations, regardless of how much money you make, unless you're highly unusual, you're always going to spend more than you make. And we have wonderful facilities which enable that today, like, like credit cards you know, where people are actually willing to give you use of their money so you don't have to defer gratification and for 17.99% up to 37.99% uh, uh, of the uh, total, uh, you know, you don't have to defer gratification. You can just spend. You don't have to defer gratification. You can just spend. I don't know how it went in America this year. I do know that year on year... The 21st day of January, there is the highest number of hospital admissions and the highest number of heart attacks of any day on the calendar in the entire year. 21st of January, year after year after year after year after year. Why? That's the day in America that the Visa and MasterCard bills appear in the post. And people begin to realize how much they overspent at Christmas and the number of hospital admissions and the number of heart attacks is higher that day, year after year after year, than any day 
of a calendar. So is there anything wrong with being rich? What well, has to do with how you get your riches and also has to do with how you use your riches and both uh, oversaving and overspending are both uh, problematic. Well, uh, uh, one, one, one final thing. That, that was the word you'd been looking for, that final word. Um, one final thing. It's not only dependent on how you get your riches, not only dependent on how you use your riches, but it's also dependent upon what you expect from your riches. Is it not a fair point that many people expect their riches to deliver them from misery. They expect their riches to make them exempt from weeping and howling. They expect their riches to secure for them, or even if not for them, for their children and their grandchildren a better future than they have in the present or have had in the past. And so when you expect your riches to uh, deliver you from misery and to make you exempt from weeping and howling, you have actually overexpected of your riches and you've actually depended on your riches to do something which they, at the end of the day, are quite unable uh, to do. You see, uh, he says, your riches have rotted. Your riches rotted. Um, what normally rots? Foodstuffs. And your garments, oh, here we are again. What happened to the garments? They're moth-eaten. And so this food, you know, sort of like the accumulation of manna, you know, for future days would result in disappointment because that manna would be rotted and ruined and spoiled. He says, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. You've, you've over-expected. You have looked to your riches to provide something for you which they are at the end of the day quite unable to provide. And you say, well, you know, what about more enduring substances? Uh, you know, like, like gold, for instance, and silver, for example. Ah, gold doesn't rot. Silver doesn't attract moths. You need to move to a new level. Well, he says here, your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion, listen to this, will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You see, then as now, there were some people who thought that their gold and silver would bear testimony for them that they had a life that was pleasing and upright before God. And so he had blessed them with, with riches. And he said, but your gold and your silver are actually corroded. And their corrosion will be not a testimony for you, but evidence against you. And they will actually eat your flesh like fire. Why? Because you have overexpected of your riches. You have had an unrealistic level of expectation about the ability of your riches to spare you agony, pain, difficulty. Question. What do Bridge End in Wales 
and Guilford in Surrey have in common? You say, wow. Among other things, I'm sure, they are two of the wealthiest postcodes in the entire UK. Bridge in Wales and, you know, Guilford, uh, Surrey. It, it doesn't get much better than, than that. I, yeah, I, w- I was reading uh, on, on the train on my way uh, to, uh, to Wimbledon. I had my Bible reading first. But then I was also reading Money Magazine's report on the <coughs> best place to live in Britain. And you'll be pleased to know that if you're Pastor Steve's age and down, the number one best place to live in all of Britain, are you sitting down, is Luton. And Jeff is going just like that. I'll explain to you after the meeting why that's the case, and that may take a little bit of the shine off of that. But then along with that, other indices reported that Luton is no longer the worst place to live in Britain, but is now the second worst place to live in Britain. Amazing how uh, one you know, index can say it's the best place to live, and another can say it's the second worst place to live in all the country. But I look at the best places to live in Bridge End and Guildford, we're always near the top, and I look at the worst places to live in Bridge Inn and Guilford never uh, uh, appear uh, at all. What's that about? Well, they're two of the wealthiest postcodes in Britain. But before you think, oh, that's great. Year after year, a Guilford postcode, and year after year, a Bridge Inn postcode have the highest divorce rate in Wales and England, respectively. And year after year, Bridge Inn Postcode in Wales and Guilford Postcode in England, uh, respectively, have the highest teen suicide rate in all of Britain. So your riches are going to give you a happy marriage and your riches are going to be good for your children. Be careful that you don't expect from your riches something your riches cannot actually produce. It's about how you get it and it's about what you do with it. And it's about what you expect from it. It depends. I'm thankful this afternoon that those of us who know and love and are seeking to follow and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, whether we are rich or poor or somewhere in between, all have a hope that is steadfast and sure. Because it is a hope that is based not only not only on the blood of bulls and goats, but also a hope which is not based on gold or silver, a hope which is based on the full, finished, final work of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And it is a hope that is imperishable. It is a hope that fades not away. It is a a hope that endures forever. And it's not down to how much money you have in your pocket or in your bank. It's down to whether or not you know and love and are seeking to follow and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you have riches, rejoice and be glad, but not in your riches. Rejoice and be glad in the Lord. And make your riches to be fully at His disposal, to be used as He sees fit for the advancement of His kingdom and the multi-generational growth of His churches. Let's sing about that just now as we stand.